Hello guys, so I won't be able to conduct a live lecture tomorrow because I'll be attending my MCLE. So I'll just uh, upload this video and you can watch it during our schedule and I'll try to keep it under two hours. So we're already on chapter four, which is all about price and other consideration. So what's the price? From the definition of the contract of sale, we understand it as the equivalent of the thing sold. Okay, but uh, in the case of Inchausti Company versus Cromwell, it says here that uh, the price is not just the equivalent of the thing being sold. It also includes uh, every incident taken into consideration for the fixing of the price put to the debit of the buyer and agreed to by him. So the seller is in fact uh, given the leeway or the, or the discretion to fix the price more than the actual value of the thing being sold. So if he incurs any other expense in relation to this, uh, to the subject matter of the sale, then the seller can go ahead and include that in fixing the price as long as it is accepted and agreed to by the buyer. So can any of the parties to the contract of sale unilaterally change the price? So upon perfection, guys, uh, that will be very difficult. Okay. So a seller cannot unilaterally increase the price uh, even if the increase is justified by the increase in construction cost. So you can't uh, just decide to adjust the price if the buyer will not be amenable to it. And the buyer is also uh, not allowed to withdraw from the sale if he finds that uh, the price is too steep. Like for example, if there's an interest imposed uh, for the payment of installment payments. So that's also not uh, allowed. Once there's been perfection guys, the seller and the buyer are both bound by the price that they agreed upon. So if, they're go if there's going to be any changes, they both need to accept those changes. So like the contract of sale itself and like the subject matter, there are also requisites for the price to be valid. So first, it must be real. So it must be real as opposed to being a simulated price or a false price. So we'll fi you'll find out later what's the distinction between these three. The price must also be in money or its equivalent. Of course, that's uh, provided for as a requisite in the contract of sale itself. And also the price must be certain and in some instances, if it's not certain yet at the perfection of the contract, uh, the legal standard is that the price must at least be ascertainable. So how do we know that the price is uh, ascertainable at least? So you'll also find that out in our discussion as we go along. So the first uh, element of a valid price is that it must be real. Okay, and there's a presumption in the law that the cost or consideration for the parties entering into the contract is in fact real. So even if the cost or consideration or the price is not stated in the contract itself, uh, there's a presumption provided in Article 1354 that the cost or consideration exists, that it is lawful, okay, and it is... Uh, the burden of the person assailing the cost or consideration to prove otherwise. So how do we uh, know that the price is real? So there must be a legal intent on the part of the buyer to pay the price and also a legal expectation on the part of the seller to receive the price. Okay, so I assigned a case for this, which is Peñalosa versus Santos. So in this case, guys, uh, Severino wanted to sell his property to Henry. Okay, and he gave 
uh, his lessee, uh, Eleuterio, the preference to buy under the same terms as Henry. So the lessee turned out to propose uh, less favorable terms. So the lesser here, uh, Severino, rejected the lessee's offer. Thereafter, uh, Severino and his buyer, Henry, entered into a deed of sale. And the price was fixed for $1.8 million. Okay, but only Henry, the buyer, ended up signing the deed. So later, the two of them executed a second deed of sale. And this time, the amount was increased. The, uh, the price was increased to $2 million. And the buyer, Henry, also put up earnest money amounting to 300000 So the balance was to be paid by the Henry out of a proceeds of a loan that he will take out from Film Life. And Henry, when he took out the loan with Film Life, uh, he actually applied for 2.5 million and he's uh, represented to Film Life that that was the purchase price for Severino's property. So once uh, this, uh, uh, once the, the, the transaction between Severino and Henry was completed, the buyer here, Henry, wanted to eject Eleuterio from the premises and he, in fact, won the ejectment case. So the buyer was able to take possession of the property and even made renovations. But the loan from Film Life, however, bad luck me for Henry, uh, was not approved. So the seller Severino refused to uh, surrender the title to the property. And the seller, in fact, Severino, demanded from Henry to vacate the property. And the ground relied upon by Severino to remove Henry from the property is that uh, the sale between them was, in fact, simulated because there was no cost or consideration because he did not receive the $2 million that was stated in the deed of sale. So the seller here claimed that he only signed the second deed of sale so that uh, Henry could use the property as collateral for the loan. So question, which is the main issue here, is there a simulation of contract as argued by Severino? Because the price stated in the deed of sale was not in fact received by him. What's the answer, guys? So Severino is wrong. Uh, there is simulation if uh, there is a declaration of a fictitious will. And this was intended by the parties to be so. And they did this in order to produce for purposes of deception the appearance of a juridical act which does not exist or is different from that which was really executed. So there's a rec there are requisites uh, to a simulated contract. Uh, first, there's an outward declaration of will different from the will of the parties. So that's what uh, will appear in that simulated deed or contract. Then the second requisite is that the false appearance must have been intended by mutual agreement of the parties. And third, the purpose is to deceive third persons. So the court ruled here that none of the requisites of a simulated contract uh, were present. So the seller here, Severino, had intent to sell the property and receive its price, which was $2 million. And he is, in fact, asserting before the court that he, had, uh, he was not paid of the purchase price. 
So the fact that Severino executed the two deeds in question primarily so that uh, Henry, uh, primarily so that the petitioner Henry could eject the tenant and enter into a loan mortgage contract with Film Life is a strong indication that he really did intend to transfer the property to Henry. So, paluin ni Severino, maro ramang kaayo, may pagibaligyan na lang niya ni Elio Terrio. So how do we ascertain the contractual intent of the parties with respect to the price? So we determine it uh, based on their contemporaneous and subsequent acts. Uh, for example, like the failure of the buyer to take possession of the property that is being sold. And when the deed states payment but no actual payment was in fact made so those are two indications to tell us whether there was legal intent on the part of the seller to receive the price and legal intent on the part of the buyer to pay the price so uh, when is there a false price uh, as we know, the price is real when there is legal intent on the part of the buyer and the seller. Uh, in the case of a false price, uh, the buyers indeed, uh, the parties uh, indeed have legal intent with respect to the price, but they do not declare it in the deed covering their agreement. And what is stated in the deed is not the price that the buyer actually intends to pay or what the buyer or what the seller intends to receive. So in this case, when there is false price, the contract is valid and the parties are bound by it under the principle of estopel. So if they state a false cost in the contract to conceal the real agreement, then it is their real agreement which binds them. And when this happens, the contract is actually subject to reformation unless there are third parties or when the government is prejudiced. So how does this happen, guys? Uh, why do parties do this? So they do this uh, foremost to avoid payment of higher sales tax. So I've been asked many times not to put the real price in the deed of sale because they're avoiding uh, a higher assessment. Okay, 6% beyond sales tax, diba. Right? So illustrative case for this will be Mate versus Court of Appeals. So in the case of Mate, uh, Josie was indebted to Innocentio and she was being threatened with prosecution for the bouncing checks that she issued. So Josie, who was a cousin, who was a lawyer, uh, and this lawyer cousin owned properties in Tacloban. So Josie asked attorney Fernando to help her. So Josie proposed to Fernando and promised that she would repurchase the properties after six months. So to reassure her cousin, the lawyer, Josie issued two post-dated checks. 1.4 million is the purchase price and 420,000 for surrendering the title to her, which she would then uh, give to Innocentio. And she would repurchase that very same property for six months. So, mo earn dai si lawyer ani. 
si lawyer kasi abi ninyo nga mo help siya kay igagaw sila na dahil siya ay ma-earn na 420,000 for surrendering that certificate. So thereafter, uh, attorney Fernando deposited the checks that uh, Josie issued. But the same with uh, Innocentio, the, those checks bounced. So Fernando started to look for uh, his cousin. Gihant na niya si Josie. But Josie already absconded. So attorney Fernando sued Josie and Innocentio for annulment of contract, contending that, that the sale was null and void for lack of consideration because no money changed hands when he signed it and the checks to redeem the property bounced. So, saman, mutala ba ni ang defense, ni ang, ang theory ni attorney Fernando para mapaanal ang sale? So, no. Uh, the court here ruled that there was actually consideration. So, in preparing and executing the deed of sale with right to repurchase and in delivering to Innocentio the land titles, Fernando actually accommodated Josie. So, she would not be criminally charged. So to ensure that the lots would be repurchased, Fernando received a check for 1.4 million. And for surrendering his title, he also received 420,000. But ang nadawat lang niya, check lang. So with this arrangement, uh, attorney Fernando was convinced that he had a good deal. But mangingilad, iyahang igagaw na si Josie. So it is plain that consideration existed at the time of the execution of the deed of sale with right to repurchase. It is, it is not only Fernando's kindness to his cousin, but also his receipt of, one, uh, of 420,000 from her, which impelled him to execute the contract. So therefore, Tony Fernando is bound by that deed of sale with right to repurchase. So, pagawa siya kwarta para ma-repurchase niya. How about in a simulated price situation? So, Article 1471 provides that if the price is simulated, the sale is void. However, it may be shown to have been in reality a donation or some other act or contract. So in a case where there's simulation of price, uh, there is no legal intent here by the parties to pay or to receive the price. So the price appears to have been paid but was never in fact paid. So what if the deed of sale states that the price what was paid but was not in fact paid so what happens here is uh, the deed of sale is considered as simulated null and void ab initio for lack of consideration however when there is a simulated sale the principle of in pari delicto non vitar actio remember this rule from our previous uh, discussion uh, it will not be applicable even though the contract is void. So what if the price is simulated, but there was actual delivery? So the delivery of the subject matter made pursuant to a simulated sale uh, is still void. So therefore, there is no transfer of ownership to the buyer. It will not produce the legal effect of transfer of ownership. So when the contract of sale is fictitious and therefore void and, in, and inexistent, then uh, no title over the subject matter can be conveyed. So no man can do anything except what he can lawfully do. Nemo potest ni si quod de jure 
support test. So let's distinguish between a real price, a simulated price, a false price, and when there is non-payment of the price. Of course, the price is real if there was legal intent to pay and to receive the price. So therefore, that's a, a valid price. If there is a simulated price, and there's no legal intent on the part on the part of the buyer and seller here, then it is void. However, it may be shown that the contract was intended to be another kind of act or contract. If there is a false price, then the parties had legal intent here, but they just uh, don't want it to be shown in the deed or instrument. So the contract is also valid and it is subject to reformation. In non-payment of the price, guys, so there is also legal intent here. So the price is fixed, but uh, later on, it is either remitted or condoned. So since there was legal intent, then the contract here is still valid. So let's move on to the second element or requisite for a valid price, which is it must be in money or its equivalent. So the price, guys, or the cost can take different forms such as the prestation or the promise of a thing or service by another. Okay, but take note that in Article 1350, it is said that in onerous contracts, the cost is understood to be for each contracting party, the prestation or promise of a thing or service by the other. So in a contract of sale, guys, since an essential element is that the price must be in money or its equivalent, um, money, as we all know, is a generic thing. So it can be subject to uh, several variations. So what is uh, what do we mean that uh, by the phrase that the price should be in money or its equivalent. So what's the equivalent of money? We have promissory notes, letters of credit, negotiable instruments, and other intangible properties that are equivalent to money. It can also be expectation of profits, or it could be cancellation of liabilities of the seller. So price and other additional consideration are those included in article 1468 so the third requisite of a valid price is that it must be certain so price is certain when it is expressed and agreed in terms of specific pesos and or centavos uh, even if the price, however, is not fixed in peso or in centavos, uh, the price is considered to still be valid if it is ascertainable. And that's in accordance with Article 1469. So the price is ascertainable when it is certain in reference to another thing that is also certain. Example of this will be found in Article 1472. And the price is also considered as ascertainable if the determination is left to the judgment of a third person who will then fix the price for the parties. So under Article 1469, the price could be fixed by referring to invoices or other documents or by, or by referring to a formula. That are that's agreed upon by the parties, and are the and under Article fourteen seventy two, uh, when the price is fixed, is that which the thing sold 
would have on a definite day or in a particular exchange or market or when an amount is fixed above or below the price on such day or in such exchange or market, then that is still considered as a price that is, that is ascertainable. So how can price be fixed by third persons? So there are three scenarios here. If the third person is unable or unwilling, then the consequence of that unwillingness will be that the contract is considered as inefficacious. So keyword guys, inefficacious. The law does not say that it is void or valid or whatever. It says inefficacious. So what happens when the contract is considered as inefficacious? Meaning it will not take effect unless the parties subsequently to subsequently decide to themselves to fix the price. So if this, uh, if this does not happen, then you cannot avail of any court remedies. Okay, okay. inefficacious man siya. will not take effect. So how can you compel the court to uh, uh, fix the price in behalf of the parties? And then another scenario is that when the third persons will act in bad faith or act by mistake, when they decide to fix the price. So in this scenario, the remedy is that uh, you can go to court, right? And have the court fix the price. However, if the third person designated by the parties to fix the price is prevented from doing uh, their job of fixing the price, and it is the fault of either the seller or the buyer, so the innocent party here can have remedies against the party at fault, okay? And can go to court and have the court fix the price. So what happens if the price uh, agreed upon by the parties at the moment of perfection uh, is fixed in separate instruments? not just in one instrument. So the rule here is that the consideration is generally agreed upon as a whole, even if it consists of several parts, and even if it is contained in one or more instruments. So the law here will, uh, the law here is that, uh, the law here is in favor of their of there being a valid cause or consideration. So even if the price is fixed in different instruments, it will be construed as whole. So the agreement between the parties will continue to be valid. So the price can be found by reference to several instruments. So it will not affect the validity of the contract. Okay, so remember this rule that the fixing of the price is not a unilateral act and it cannot be left to the discretion of the of one of the contracting parties. Okay, but if the fixing of the price by one of the parties is accepted by the other, then the sale is considered as already perfected. Okay, get out what man. So that's the rule in Article 1473. What happens if the price is considered as unascertainable? So remember that when the price is not certain, the law provides that the contract is inefficacious, meaning the contract is unable to produce the effect wanted by the parties. But there are exceptions to this rule, guys. 
And that happens when there has already been appropriation by the buyer, meaning he has taken possession of the thing, subject matter of the sale. And there has been uh, either partial or full delivery of the thing. And the buyer is already enjoying or benefiting from the thing. So the buyer here is already liable to pay a reasonable price for the thing. So the buyer here can be sued for specific performance already. But there are requisites in order to file a suit for specific performance. Uh, first, you must be able to prove that there was already a meeting of the minds and that the agreement on the price is that the price would be paid, but there is failure to meet the criteria of the price being certain or ascertainable. So, dapat nagya po sa legal intent na mubaya judo price si buyer. Then, third requisite is that there was delivery by the seller and appropriation by the buyer of the subject matter of the sale. So remember that the the, the previous doc, the previous rule we uh, discussed or the appropriation doctrine uh, it's applicable only in uh, sale wherein the subject matter is personal properties and uh, these personal properties has been transformed by the buyer and can no longer be returned to the seller the rule does not apply in the case of real properties since it is governed by the rule on builders in good faith under articles 445 and 456 of the civil code so illustrative case for this is the case of riot versus court of appeals in this case guys the spouses riot wanted to purchase a house and lot Uh, and this particular uh, subdivision or development uh, are intended only for buyers who could obtain housing loan from GSIS. So, para makapalit ka o unit aning a development, you must be able to secure a loan only from GSIS. So, the spouses here were not GSIS members. So, they negotiated with Amparo to assist them in looking for GSIS members who will act as accommodation parties and allow them to use their policies. So Amparo here uh, gave the spouses an estimate for the cost of the unit, which had to be financed by GSIS. So the spouses applied directly with the developer so they paid 32000 to the developer which amount would be credited to the purchase price and the purchase price here however will be determined after the approval of the GSIS loan. So murag na sila eh, fixer guys, si spouses riot. Uh, meantime, the spouses riot were able to uh, enter into possession of the housing units. But it later turned out that the GSIS disapproved their loan. So they couldn't file any other uh, financing for the unit and the developer sued the spouses in an ejectment suit when they refused to vacate the property. So the spouses were indeed evicted from the property. But they filed a, a suit for specific performance against the developer. And they contended that there was a perfected contract of sale that they can enforce against the developer, especially since they already occupied the housing unit. So what's uh, what's the 
Uh, what's the ruling in this case here? Are the spouses riot correct? So no, they are not correct. Uh, even though there was delivery and appropriation by the buyer, uh, there is no perfected contract of sale because, because there was no meeting of the minds on the price. So the records do not show the total cost of the units in question and the payment schemes therefore. So the developer was to enter into agreements concerning the subject units with the spouses only upon approval of the loan. But since the loan did not materialize, then uh, there was no, uh, there was no uh, instance at all that the developer could have entered into an agreement with the spouses, right? So the occupation by the petitioners of the unit in question for more than three years prior to the ejectment case was merely by virtue of forbearance of private respondent of the private respondent who was the developer. So in the 1976 bar, this question was asked. Uh, A sells his 1976 Colt, Lan Colt Lancer sedan to B and leaves it to, to B to determine the price. If B refuses to fix the price and simply takes the car, is he still obliged to pay the price? So you know the answer to this now. So adequacy of price. So although we know that the contract of sale is an onerous contract, and also a commutative contract. Uh, there's no legal requirement for the price to be exactly the same value as the subject matter that was delivered. So the test for commutativeness is met when the parties believe honestly that they received good value for what they have given up in exchange. So as long as the parties are satisfied, then that meets the commutativeness test. So what happens when there is inadequacy of the price? So inadequacy of the price, or also called as lesion, does not actually invalidate the contract. And the only exception to this rule is when there is proof that there was fraud, mistake, or undue influence. And when there is uh, lesion or, in that in, or inadequacy, then the contract is considered as uh, resistible under Article 1381. Okay, but take note, guys, na lesion or inadequacy, uh, in order to be considered, uh, in order to render the contract resistible, it must be accompanied by this fraud, mistake, or undue influence. Okay, so examples of uh, these will be uh, under Article 1381. When a guardian in representation of the ward enters into a contract wherein uh, the ward will suffer lesion by more than one fourth of the value of the object of the sale. And same rule. With respect to uh, representatives of persons who are considered as absentees, presumed dead, etc. If they suffer a lesion of more than one fourth of the value of the object of the sale, then the contract is considered as resistible. So when does a con when does a contract of sale become void due to inadequacy of the price? So the rule here that the rule here with respect to judicial sales is that inadequacy of the price is not a sufficient ground for setting aside a sale. Take note, guys, judicial sales. What are these? So kanang mga foreclosure sales or mga execution sales. When property is put up in public auction in order to either satisfy the debt owed to a mortgagor or some other creditor of the property owner 
or in execution sales when it is required to sell the properties of the obligee in order to satisfy the judgment rendered by the court. Did I oblige oblige or they sorry. So in judicial sales, uh, inadequacy of the price during public auction will not uh, justify setting aside of the sale. The only exception is when the price is so shocking to the conscience. And if there is a showing that in the event of a resale of the properties, a better price can be obtained. Okay, so this is uh, demonstrated in the case of Tayenko versus Court of Appeals. But there is an exception to the exception. And that is in the case of De Leon versus Salvador. So what happened in Tayenko versus Court of Appeals? Here, five co-owners agreed to partition their property owned in common. And they did it in a judicial partition. The court approved their agreement to sell the property and then subdivide the profits. At the auction, the property was valued at 40,500 pesos. So there was one bidder, Jose, and he submitted a bid of 11,250 pesos. But Jose, however, only had 7,000 in cash. So by noon, Jose could only produce 8,100 pesos. So a new bid was thus tendered by Roberto for 12,000 pesos and he was able to pay it in cash. So the sheriff issued to Roberto the receipt for the sale. So Jose assailed the sale to Roberto as being void because inadequate daw siya kay ang value sa property kay 40,500 man. So the losing bidder, is he correct? So the court ruled here that no, uh, Jose is not correct. So inadequacy of the price, unless shocking to the conscience, is not a ground to invalidate the sale. So in this particular case, um, court here quoted Moran, a civil law jurist or author. And Moran here lists down a good number of cases upon which the Tayanko case may be compared. So for example, kaning sa kaso nga Director of Lands versus Abarca, uh, the a property worth 60,000 pesos was only sold for 877 pesos and 25 centavos. So that's shocking to the conscience. In the case of BPI versus Grese, wherein a property worth uh, 60,000 was sold only for 25,000. 45,940 uh, property, baligya lang o 15,000, and so forth. So the court ruled here, guys, that even if the lot in question were valued at 40500 its sale for 12000 does not appear to be inadequate when compared with these cases. So mas shocking gining ubano, pero di gihapon siya, wala gihapon siya gisat aside sa court. What more in the case of Tayenko na it sold for 12000 pesos. So what makes this De Leon versus Salvador case an exception to the exception? So in this case, guys, uh, Enrique obtained a judgment for damages against his debtor Eusebio. So Eusebio's properties was thus levied for execution. And at the execution sale, the properties were valued at 385,000 pesos. And it was sold to Aurora, the sister of Enrique as the highest bidder for the total amount of 30,194 pesos. Uh, because uh, the property was then subject to an existing mortgage 
Lian, the amount of 120,000. So, although 30,000 ra ang na fetch na price at that execution sale, the uh, winning bidder here will have to assume payment or liability for the mortgage lien on the property. So, Eusebio, the owner, uh, filed a complaint for annulment of the execution sale for being anomalous and irregular and for gross inadequacy of the price. So, can the sale be set aside considering the ruling in Tayenko? So, the court ruled here that no. As to, as to the alleged gross inadequacy of the price, Uh, the court here said that even though it was only 30,000, you consider the fact that there is an existing mortgage lien on the property and it was for a uh, substantial amount, 120,000. Uh, court here said that the, the applicable rule on forced sales, like judicial sales, where the law gives the owner the right of redemption, is that uh, in such cases, uh, the gross inadequacy or inadequacy of the price is not set aside because uh, it, the low price fetched during the public auction will actually allow the uh, property owner to redeem the price. Because in judicial sales, there is a right of redemption. So it's easier for the owner to effect the redemption It was if it was sold for a lower price than its actual value. So in cases when there is a right to redeem, inadequacy of price should not be material because the, ju the judgment debtor may reacquire the property or also sell his right to redeem and thus recover the loss he claims to have suffered by, of the, by reason of the price obtained at the auction sale. So there you go, guys. That's the reasoning why uh, inadequacy of the price in judicial sales are not set aside. So it actually turns out to be in favor of the uh, property owner or the debtor so that he can redeem the property. And if, and if the judgment debtor is not able to redeem the property, then he can sell the right of redemption and recover the price of the property less the uh, less the price already received as a redemption as a auction sale but usually that goes to the anuman creditor or to court cost nominal price so what is nominal price uh, let's find out in the case of ong versus ong so in this case, guys, uh, Imelda Ong, for and in consideration of one peso and other valuable considerations, executed a quit claim deed in favor of Sandra Maruzzo, a minor, wherein she transferred, released, assigned, and forever quit claimed all her rights, title, interest, and participation in one half of an undivided portion of a parcel of land. So she did this back in 1972, but in 1980, Imelda revoked the deed of quit claim and donated the whole property to her son, Rex Ong Jimenez. So Sandra uh, thereafter filed a complaint for revocation of the donation to Rex, contending that Imelda sold the land to her for one peso. So is there a valid sale to Sandra? who was a minor and with the price at just one peso. So in this case, guys, um, the court ruled that uh, there was a valid sale. It was uh, stated differently. The cost or consideration is not the one peso alone 
but also the other valuable considerations. So the Supreme Court, quoting the appellate court, uh, they apply the legal presumption of sufficient cause or consideration supporting the contract. So the execution of the deed purporting to convey ownership of a real property is in itself prima facie evidence of the existence of a valuable consideration. The party alleging lack of consideration has the burden of proving it. Right? So wala na wala na, na disprove ang presumption, the legal presumption in this case. So gross inadequacy of the price. Uh, similar to inadequacy of price, uh, it will not affect the validity of the contract of sale. Okay, but it can indicate a defect in the consent or that the parties intended to enter into some other act or contract. So the sale remains valid even if the price is very low. Okay, exception, however, is when there is vitiation of consent and when the price is so inadequate as to shock the conscience of the court. So rule of thumb, if the properties are sold for only around 10% of their value, and also in cases of pleasure under Article 1381, so paragraph 1 and 2, but among our receivable contracts. So how do we distinguish between legal effects of gross inadequacy of price and simulated price? So let's take a look at the case of Bravo Guerrero versus Bravo. So in this case, guys, uh, the court had occasion to rule that uh, the two, simulation and gross inadequacy, are distinct legal concepts with different legal effects. So if the contract is simulated, then the contract is void and can produce no legal effect. However, when the consideration is only inadequate, uh, but there is nevertheless an agreement between the parties, then the, that agreement is valid and binding between them. So the concept of a simulated sale is thus incompatible with inadequacy of price. Because when the parties agree on a price as the actual consideration, uh, the sale is not simulated even if there was inadequacy of the price. So gross inadequacy will not result into a void contract. It will not affect the validity of the contract at all. So just read the facts of this case. So manner of payment, uh, will that uh, affect the price? So in Article 1179, the law presumes that payment is immediately demandable. But if uh, there is any stipulation or agreement indicating that a different term of payment would be applicable, then in that situation, uh, the manner of payment is considered as an essential ingredient before a valid and binding contract of sale can exist since it is part of the prestation of the contract. So when is the term and manner of payment then not uh, essential? So one instance will be when there is only a contract to sell and not an absolute or conditional sale. So remember this, uh, if uh, there is any circumstance showing that the payment is not immediately demandable and that a different term of payment would be applicable and that that different term of payment must be one wherein there was meeting of the minds between the parties, then the manner of payment 
will become an important requisite for there to be a valid and binding contract of sale. So it is then considered as part of the prestation of the contract. So two cases assigned for this concept, guys. Uh, in the case of Toyota Show versus Court of Appeals. So there's an agreement here. And issue that must be resolved with respect to this agreement. Is there a perfected contract of sale without agreement on the full purchase price and the manner of payment of the balance? So take a look here at the agreement between Mr. Sosa and Popong Bernardo of Toyota Shaw Incorporated. So per this agreement, uh, all it requires that all necessary documents be submitted to Toyota Shaw a week after upon arrival of Mr. Sosa from Marinduque, where the unit will be used on the 19th of June. So the down payment of 100,000 pesos must be paid by Mr. Sosa on June 15, 1989. Then Toyota uh, Toyota will then release the light ace, color yellow, for pickup on June 17 at 10 a.m. So this agreement was signed by Popong Bernardo, who is a personal or a representative of Toyota. So perusing this agreement, guys, can you readily identify here if there was a price fix by the parties and how the price will be paid thereafter? Yang dimension na 100,000 down payment, which must be made by Mr. Sosa, the buyer. So is there a perfected contract of sale? Court ruled here that no. Uh, there was no perfected contract of sale. Uh, there was no obligation on the part of Toyota to transfer ownership and no correlative obligation on the part of Mr. Sosa, the buyer, to pay a price certain. So the provision on the down payment of 100,000 made no specific reference to a sale on installment uh, based uh, to a sale of a vehicle. If it was intended for a contract of sale, it could only refer to a sale on installment basis. However, nothing was mentioned about the full purchase price and the manner of uh, and, and the manner of how the installments were to be paid. So in this instance, uh, it did not produce perfection of a contract of sale. Katihik sa words atong ko ano? I assume mga nag-draft atong agreement kay si Toyota. But it's so big. I wonder if na-deliver to ang sakinan. So... Payment of the price and valuable consideration. Uh, what is an element of the contract of sale? Is it payment of the price or is it valuable consideration? So the answer is valuable consideration. Uh, although payment of the price is an obligation of the buyer, it is not required to perfect the contract of sale. As long as there was meeting on uh, meeting of the minds that the cost or object of the contract involves a valuable consideration, then that will perfect the contract of sale. But actual payment of the price, guys, uh, it will not affect perfection. 
it will not negate perfection. So how do you prove that there was payment of the price? So proof of payment is officially the official receipt. And this is, this is one that will be issued by the seller. So take note that sales invoices uh, do not actually evidence payment, but they only evidence receipt of the goods. Question. Can the official receipt itself prove the existence of the contract of sale? So let's take a look at these cases. So in Liabres versus Court of Appeals, uh, Vicente was the administrator of his late, late wife's estate. So Catalino bought from Vicente a lot belonging to the estate. And Vicente issued a receipt for the partial payment of 1000 However, Vicente was replaced as administrator by Phil Trust Company. And they sold the properties of the estate, including the one that was sold to Catalino. And the buyer here was Monotok Realty. So Catalino sued Monotok Realty for quieting of title and presented his receipt as proof of the sale of the lot to him. So will that be sufficient proof of the perfection of the contract of sale? Do you think, guys? So the court ruled here, no. Uh, the receipt does not show that there were that there was a consent or meeting of the minds of the parties, especially pertaining to the determinate subject matter and the price certain in money or its equivalent. So the receipt can neither be regarded as a contract of sale or a promise to sell. There was merely an acknowledgement of the sum of 1,000 pesos. So there was no agreement for the total purchase price of the land nor of the monthly installment to be paid by the buyer. In Coronel, however, uh, Romulo Coronel here and his siblings uh, inherited the property. So Ramona wanted to buy the land and told her mother to pay 50000 as down payment. So the Coronel siblings executed a document entitled Receipt of Down Payment in favor of Ramona. And that document provides that once the title to the property was transferred to the name of the Coronel siblings, they would thereafter execute a deed of sale in favor of Ramona. So when that happens, then Ramona will pay the balance of 1.24 million. So the Coronel siblings were able to have the properties titled in their name, but they sold the properties to a different person, Catalina, for 1.58 million because Ramona left for the United States. So the Coronel siblings then rescinded the document receipt of down payment and deposited the money that Ramona paid as down payment in trust. So Ramona filed a complaint for specific performance against the Coronel siblings. And she also had the titles to the property annotated with this pendants. So Ramona used this receipt of down payment to prove that the Coronel siblings sold the property to her. So does the document evidence a contract of sale or did it evidence a contract of a contract to sell? So the court ruled here that the document was in fact a contract of sale because there was no express reservation of ownership or title to the subject parcel of land. So the plain language of the subject document is that uh, it, all, it had all the elements of a conditional contract of sale, consummation of which is subject only to the successful transfer of the titles to the name of uh, the coronel siblings who were selling it. How about Intigno versus Aquino? So the spouses Aquino here sued Isidro for specific performance uh, for a contract of sale of a fish pond. So they compromised here 
and Isidro recognized the contract, but uh, the con uh, the spouses Aquino granted Isidro the right to repurchase after the lapse of seven years, and the court uh, approved this compromise agreement. Isidro, however, died in 1986, and his daughter Zenaida wanted to recover the fish pond. So in 1989, she tried to repurchase the fish pond and she consigned payment in court. But the court dismissed the consignation because seven years have not yet elapsed. In 1991, Sinaida filed again another motion to execute the compromise agreement. But this was also denied by the court. So Zenaida filed a petition for revival of judgment. And this was opposed by the spouses at Pino because uh, they allege that Isidro sold his right to repurchase in a deed of sale executed in 1985. So spouses Aquino here claim that they have seven receipts to prove that they purchased the that they bought the right of repurchase from Isidro. But they say, however, that the receipts were kept by Isidro. So Zenaida denied the admissibility of the deed of sale because it was fraudulent since it was not acknowledged by Isidro. And she also assailed that the fact that the deed was notarized by a judge. So, so Zenaida questioned why the spouses Aquino did not adduce the deed of sale in their previous proceedings and the lack of receipts to prove the alleged sale. So issue here. Can a valid sale be proven by the deed of sale presented by the spouses Aquino without the corresponding receipts to prove the actual payment of consideration? So the court ruled here that no. Uh, in itself, the absence of receipts or any proof of, con of consideration would not be conclusive uh, since consideration is always presumed. However, uh, it, the court here uh, appreciated several circum circumstances. And uh, given the totality of circumstances surrounding this case, the absence of proof of payment militates against the claims of the spouses Aquino. And they also questioned the origins of the deed of sale. Uh, they said that it was dubious because it was belatedly submitted and no receipts could be presented by the spouses Aquino. So, si spouses Aquino manggod, ni claim manggod sila nga naipito ka resibo. Wala lang sila ni rely sa presumption sa law. No? And it was uh, found by the court to be against human nature. Because if they did buy the right to repurchase from Isidro, then it would be ordinary human nature to ask for receipts from the seller okay so their excuse that isidro kept the receipts was not consistent with human nature so non-payment of the price guys uh non-payment of the price or the balance of the price does not render the sale inexistent or invalid. Okay, always remember that. Porket wakabayad, binato tinuod ang inyuhang transaction. So, as long as the price is real, the time of perfection, even if the buyer later, uh, later cannot pay for that price, then the sale is considered as valid. So, non-payment of the price, do we consider it as a resolutory condition or do we consider it as a breach of contract? So, what if the price is later condoned or remitted by the seller? 
So what if the money paid is counterfeit? So how do you answer these questions? Will that affect the validity of the price? Okay, so it, uh, we actually consider non-payment of the price as uh, one that gives a right to the seller to either demand specific performance or rescission. So price, guys, is only considered as a breach of contract. It is not a resolutory condition unless the agreement or the deed is so worded as to make non-payment of the price a resolutory condition. So generally, non-payment of the price is just a breach of contract. So let's take a look at this special law, which is Republic Act 7581, or the Price Act of 1992. So this is a law which regulates price. And the price can be regulated by the Department of Agriculture. So they can uh, issue suggested retail price or impose price control or price freeze or price ceiling or any or all basic necessities and price commodities. So under this uh, special law, guys, there's automatic price freeze for basic necessities. And uh, it says here that there can be automatic freeze if there is a proclamation or declaration of a disaster or there is a state of calamity and uh, several similar uh, situations. State of rebellion, state of war, and there is suspension of the privilege of the, of the writ of habeas corpus, so invasion. So those are the instances when there is an automatic price freeze for basic necessities. Para wai magrayot ba? So there can be price ceiling for basic necessities and prime commodities. So this is declared so by the president upon recommendation of the National Price Coordinating Council. And there are also uh, certain circumstances when there can be a price ceiling imposed. Pandemic, guys, they did this. Price ceiling or suggested retail price, na di ka pwede mo ano, lapas. So the SRP. So the SRP is regularly issued by the DA, DTI, DOH, DOE, and DNR, uh, even during non-emergency and comparable situations. So the SRP guys, although issued by these uh, government agencies, it's actually set by manufacturers and the implementing, uh, the implementing agency will only evaluate if those SRP as fixed by the, by the manufacturers are reasonable. So they evaluate it if it's reasonable in comparison to changes in the price of raw materials and other production costs. So violation of the automatic price control or mandated price ceiling is punishable by imprisonment. So there's also the offense of price manipulation like hoarding, profiteering, or cartel. Uh, 
also guys uh, suppliers can also initiate their own price limits called resale price maintenance or rpm so this is distinct from the srp uh, fixed by the set by the government so the resale price maintenance is a form of a vertical restraint and is generally prohibited in most jurisdictions. So is this RPM prohibited in our jurisdiction? So yes, it is under Article 186 of the Revised Penal Code. So the RPC makes it unlawful for any person who shall enter into any contract or agreement or take any part in a conspiracy or combination in the form of a trust or otherwise in restraint of trade or commerce or to prevent by any artificial means free competition in the market among others. So section 2A of DOJ Circular 005 has declared that vertical agreements to maintain a resale price are anti-competitive. So, masood sa dire ang kanang sa Philippine Competition Act is price manipulation. Right, so uh, that concludes our discussion on Chapter 4, guys. So, I'll be converting this uh, recording. So, I hope it's under two hours lang. Right, so uh, see you next meeting.